Adam Helmy, okay, let's let's talk about something which um, a lot of people struggle with in, in their working lives, right? Do they choose work, uh, a pursuit which they are passionate about, or do they choose something uh, which they are purpose-driven about, i.e., is it something which is driven by necessity or is it something which they're driven by passion, right? And which is the most, re- I think, I think most importantly, which one is going to be the most rewarding, um, you know, over the long term? Mm. Well, okay, so Chong, thank you, first of all, having, for having me back. I'm uh, very happy to be back here. Um, so when I first found out that we we're going to talk about this today, I was actually very, very excited. So I thought to myself, okay, great. I get to talk about what I love to do. I get to share it with people and, uh, and you know, uh, I get to talk about something that f- that's fulfilling to me. But then when I really thought about it, I thought, okay, what is my passion? Right? Do I really know what my passion is? I know what, what um, triggers me and what makes me feel good, but is that, is that necessarily my passion? So what I did was I went uh, on YouTube, I think it was about two days ago, I actually searched what is passion or, or how do you find your passion, right? And I was reading a couple of articles and interestingly, one of the things that I, that I actually came across was this guy, he said, I um, forget which video it was exactly, but he was saying, forget about looking for your passion, right? I think what you, what you need to be looking for is looking for something that drives you, right? What gives you that self satisfaction, whether that be in, uh, in small doses or, or you know, in, in, uh, in, a, in, a big, in a bigger way. So the thing is with me is that I grew up in a uh, family that, and my parents really instilled the values of charity to me. Um, one of the things that I love doing is helping people and giving, giving in general. Now, I was quite fortunate enough to grow up in a, uh, you know, in a relatively um, stable and secure family uh, in terms of, you know, we were um, probably upper class M40. Um, and I was very, you know, fortunate enough to also be able to study abroad, to get a good education and everything. So when I was younger, my dad especially was very, uh, he, he, he made sure that I knew to give at a very young age. So I think uh, when I was, I think it started off with, you know, when we first start going to prayers at about seven years old, right, for Muslims, uh, every Friday we would go to prayers and what he would do is he would give me one ringgit and then he would keep one ringgit for himself. Now this one ringgit was supposed to be given to the masjid or the mosque um, every week, right? So from a very young age, I already knew that giving was an important part of of just life in general because this is something habitual that he instilled from me from the start. Um, again, like I mentioned earlier, because of I feel that you know I was quite fortunate in the way that I grew up, so giving was a way to receive that instant gratification. Um, you know, it makes you feel good. When, when, when you give and you know that you've impacted somebody's life, whether it be big or small, you feel that stuff, you feel that it hits different, you know. Um, so yeah, one of the things that I would love to do in, in, in life is, you know, eventually I would love to be able to um, set up my own foundation and be able to really contribute back and give back, right? Um, so, you know, in terms of my passion, I think what really drives me is that satisfaction of empowering others and giving them a reason of self-worth, right? That is what I would love to do in the long term and, and kind of what we do here at Hey Alfred as well is really empowering people to uh, you know, manage their finances and take care of their well-being. Um, so yeah, I mean, that is one of the things that I, that, that in terms of my passion, right? Um, this kind of leads on into, uh, into, into Hey Alfred itself, whereby um, I'm still trying to, I, I can't say that I was passionate about personal finance when I first started this, right? When I first started this, I, the, the idea was to help myself and to ins- hello, Sean? Yeah, to help myself. And uh, I wasn't really thinking about anybody else, but along the way, when we, when we finally, uh, you know, started to get a bit more traction and people were responding to us, I found it to be very fulfilling. And so this sort of has slowly, I've been able to incorporate this into something that I enjoy doing. And when you enjoy doing something, you naturally become passionate about it, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's all about growth and progression. So eventually, um, this is sort of really, you know, helping others in terms of their personal finances does has eventually, you know, sort of become a part of that charity or that giving. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, 
wise people, much wiser than me, have uh, said many times before that the act of giving is much more fulfilling than the act of taking. And to some extent, I mean, what Hey Alfred is doing and what I'm doing on YouTube, there's such a long gestation period between what you do and how you start it. And in terms of seeing some kind of return on that investment, whether it's time or whether it's capital, in the early weeks, months, days, even years in certain cases, right, um, it's almost thankless because you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. But what we do in terms of giving information, trying to emancipate people, give them financial freedom, or some idea of the concept of the importance of financial freedom, that in itself is very fulfilling. Um, but what I also want to um, observe as well, Adam, is... is, is we run the risk of getting a little bit removed from reality because at the end of the day, this whole discussion between passion and and basically purpose, um, you know, when you are an immigrant, okay, or when you are dirt poor, when you're B40, not even B40, B5, right? Be like at the bottom of the rung. You have no idea. You are, you are not considering whether or not you should do a job which you are passionate about. You, if, especially if you're a father with young children, you are doing what it takes, whatever it takes to put food on the table. Do you know what I mean? Um, so, 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 so that's the immigrant mentality. And Malaysia is made up of a lot of immigrants. I mean, you go back a couple hundred years, you've got the Chinese, then you've got the recent one or two generations, there's a lot of Bangladeshis and Nepalese, right? They are not interested, you know, in, in passion. They, they might be down the line in terms of Maslow's law of hierarchies or right, needs, but today... It's about the food on today's table, and then tomorrow is a different game altogether. Yeah, so, I mean, like, you know, again, it's, it's, it's really difficult because, uh, you know, you make, they're, they're making ends meet every month. That's right. right. And even for me, my purpose has, you know, they're really focused on, on their family and, 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 like you mentioned, right, a, a father with two kids. Now, maybe I'll just give you a bit of story about myself then, something I probably haven't shared with you before. Now, um, my father was very dear to me and unfortunately I lost my father back in 2017. Um, I lost him to cancer and so that for me was a real eye-opener, all right. Um, like I said, he, he, he worked, uh, I, I grew up in a very relatively comfortable and so my father worked very hard his entire life to build up that kind of future for me. Um, so when he finally passed, uh, it really hit me and struck me that all I, everything I do um, from here on out will be for my family because I am the only boy within my family and obviously being you know coming from Asian culture that carries some kind of weighing right um, the eldest the eldest boy amongst amongst uh, my immediate family as well as the eldest boy uh, amongst my extended family amongst my first cousins right um, so I, I really I, I really took that to heart when he passed away and I said okay everything I do from here on out is going to be taking care of my mother and to be taking care of my sister um, and my grandmothers who are, who are still around, thankfully, thank God. Um, so uh, this has been my purpose in life for the past four years, to ensure that um, I, I, you know, to carry on my father's legacy. I am my father's son um, and, and uh, you know, I only wish that he could be here today to see that, um, to see what I've achieved, you know, because uh, I think when he was around, I was always a bit more Obviously, you take it for granted when they're around. I don't know if you've lost any one of your parents or your grandparents that you were close to Chong, but you tend to realize how much they did um, after they're gone, right? You don't know what you have till it's gone. Um, so this is something that I'm still working on. Obviously, I'm still grieving. Four years is not a long time to get over somebody, right? Um, especially your parents that, you know, yeah, they, they raised you, you know? Um, so uh, everything I do today, whether it be uh, my startup that I'm r currently running right now, um, the bigger purpose to what I do is obviously to put food on the table. Um, so, you know, starting up the startup, in fact, when, 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 the, when us founders got together, I, I, I invested via um, my own family fund, right? So I'm sure that my mom is able to benefit, I ensure that my sister is able to benefit from any rewards we might get at the end of this. Um, so I, really in my decision making process throughout life, I always ensure that my family are at the forefront of it. That's number one, charity starts at home, right? So this is a nice lead into what we were talking about before. Um, you gotta help yourself and your family before you can help others. Um, you know, hopefully this in the future, this can extend to, to me helping people more directly in terms of, you know, maybe charity causes. But in the meantime, of course, I have A. Alfred, 
to, to connect with these people that I probably wouldn't usually be able to. In fact, I go in Clubhouse every other night. I don't know if you're on that app yet, Sean. But, you know, uh, this is where I'm actually able to engage with, with, with people who, who are probably less fortunate and then give them some tips and insights to how they can better themselves, whether that be financially or if they just want to talk about, you know, life and how, it's, how, it, how they're struggling with it, right? Um, so it's in interesting because there was a discussion the other day and they were talking about... Um, M40s and sorry T20s and M40s talking about B40s which was interesting because uh, there was a where were the B40s got... <laughs> where were the sorry? B40s the B40s exactly you know I mean? that's a thing correct it's like, so it's they like, were just talking it's like government ministers um, talking on behalf of the of the young but there's yeah. no young government ministers <laughs> yeah so the, the topic the topic of the room I found was a bit controversial I was like why is the topic of the room T20s talking about B40s I actually went in there and I said I find it interesting that you guys are talking about the B40 um, population when first of all they're not here you don't have any you don't have any input from them um, and this whole idea of the, the, the topic itself, when you say T20 over, talking about B40, what are you trying to imply? And I said this, and then the whole room just went quiet. They, could, they didn't, didn't really know how to respond. Um, so I think there needs to be a lot more, you know, it's, it's all well and good that we're talking about this. Um, but I think also this is the first step to bridging that sort of uh, misunderstanding, right? So that I actually would welcome people to come onto Clubhouse. Um, and so I can actually engage with these people because otherwise I probably wouldn't be able to, right? And I think... Uh, I mean, it's a great platform for that. Um, but yeah, just going back to, to, to what I was mentioning earlier, th this whole idea of what my purpose is in life right now is to take care of family. That is my immediate purpose. Um, and I think naturally things sort of flow on from there, right? When you take care of yourself and you take care of your family, eventually this sort of positivity and this sort of good messaging and, and uh, the good sort of spreads around you. So I'm very passionate about being able to help others but my purpose is to help my family first. Um, that's how I've sort of viewed it from, from you know, ever since that passed, yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting value, Adam, because um, especially the young, when they come out of university, right, and especially their parents have paid a lot of money for their education, um, maybe if you studied medicine, for example, right, then your, your objective is, is focused on making that one million ringgit back in terms of the school fees that your father's paid for. So you don't really think about other people in the community. Uh, you, you think about um, recovering some of that investment and you think about the commercial interest behind that job. Uh, and you can see that with a lot of doctors today, right? A lot of doctors today, they've, they've forgotten why they're doctors in the first place. Um, and, and I've got a real problem with that. It's, it's like education as well. So when, when you say you put family at the forefront of everything that you do, it's an age-old objective because whether or not you're 75 or whether you're 25, if you put your family first, then that's a good objective to have. Then the thing is, if your family comes first, then it becomes less a case of what you truly love doing, but you, it's a case of just needs must, right? If, if you've got to put food on the table, that's what you've got to do. But then that's, the first, that's only the first step because then the second step is then what do you do to put food on the table, right? Is it going to be yeah. something which you enjoy or is it something that you have to do out of necessity? Is it something that is legal or is it going to be something that's illegal or on the fringe of legality, right? And I, I, want, to, I want to reference this book. Um, this is company in Malaysia. It's one of the biggest property companies. Right? It's called IGB, right? Ipo Garden Bahad, uh, founded by the two brothers, the Tan family, the Tan brothers, right? So Dato Tan Chenam, which is, you know, he's, he's passed away now, right? A uh, couple of, well, 20 years ago, he wrote a book called Never Assume Because It Makes an Ass Out of You and Me. It wasn't a bestseller, right? But one of the tenets... I've of that heard he, the quote before, yeah. That's right, I've right? I've heard the quote so, before, yeah. So one of the tenets of his working life is that you don't work because you love the job. You work because you've got to put food on the table. And that's the classic immigrant mentality. And when you analyze uh, in America, how many billionaires are in America now, right? Mark Zuckerberg is an immigrant or came from immigrant stock. Uh, the Google... Uh, founders, right? Larry Page and Sergey Brin, both Russian, right? Uh, immigrant stock. Elon Musk is himself from South Africa. He ran away from South Africa because of apartheid. So, so, so that immigrant mentality, it drives you, it, that hunger drives you, you know. I, th I think there's something there. And I think Malaysia doesn't really, it doesn't put enough stock in its immigrants, whether or not it's the Chinese of 200 years ago, or whether it's not, it's the Bangladeshis. And the Bangladeshis, they work bloody hard, mate. 
the Napoli's they work bloody hard, man. You know what I mean? And some of these guys, they're gonna be they're gonna be something in one in ten, twenty years time. You know, no joke. I'm I'm, I'm not kidding you. For sure, I think like Im- like you know this idea, the, the immigrant mentality, you know that hardship that comes with it, it breeds right. success almost, right? And uh, you know, I mean, that's a thing. Coming from from perhaps uh, a background whereby you know you don't have to struggle as much, uh, you don't think about these things that often. Um, you know, people like Elon Musk and people like you know Mark Zuckerberg. Yes, they 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 also you know they they high school dropouts. I don't I don't really know what their uh, their their backgrounds are, but obviously um, they have a you know, coming from this immigrant mentality, like I, obviously, I think I have a lot of friends whose parents actually did move abroad. They're Malaysians originally, but then they moved abroad maybe 30 or 40 years ago to start a life elsewhere, right? So that makes them immigrants coming from Malaysia. And the sort of hustle that they go through is very different. It's right? no joke. So when they're abroad, it's, no it's joke. not a joke. It's not a Mate, joke. You think, it's, it's, that's right, right? You go to Canada, you go to Australia, and you think it's the land of milk um, and honey. Forget Correct. about yeah. it, man. You are nobody. You might have a master's in economics. When you go there, you're you're gonna get a job as a bus driver, man. You know what I mean? But yeah, you gotta go. Like when I was even in Australia, I mean, I, I lived there for a long time, and I mean, we weren't necessarily an immigrant family. My dad has a business running out of Malaysia, and he was flying in and out. But we made a lot of friends when we were over there, and I, I found that a lot of them did come from Malaysia, right? And I, I was thinking to myself, okay, look, listen, you could have a fa- like a relatively comfortable life living back home in Malaysia. Why have you moved to a country where you have to start from the bottom again, right? Re- you know, from the bottom, like, relatively. And, uh, you know, it's just, I don't know, maybe they were, they were fleeing from something, right? This is the immigrant mentality. Usually they're, they're fleeing from something, they're running away from something, they're chasing better opportunity. Um, but I found that the drive that that was in them was was significantly different because obviously for me I was an international student coming over there, and um, you know so just you know I just have my education there and I'm just growing up there. But I didn't you know struggle in finding a job and putting food on the table. That was all you know that was coming from my parents. My dad was still working very hard. He was wasn't an immigrant working there, but he was still hustling you know coming in and out. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, this, this immigrant mentality definitely breeds a lot of uh, success. Uh, that's proven and we can see that. Uh, I hope that, you know, that I could be there one day. Unfortunately, maybe I don't have the stock for it. Um, but yeah, for sure, I, get, I, I see your point for sure. They, 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 they're the different kind, they're the different kind. The motivation that they have and the struggles that they go through, you know. Um, and the failure that they go through, and this is something I'm discovering right now and at 25 and 26 only now, I'm discovering where it is to fail. These people have probably failed before in their teens or even when they're younger. And we're talking about like hard struggle kind of failure, right? For me, not right now at this point in time, failure is not getting my next investment into the company, for example, right? And that's, we're talking about millions or like hundreds of thousands to run this business. And they're looking for, you know, dollars to put food on the table. Yeah, it's, it's something which I'm actually genuinely concerned about, Adam, because, you know, people... Okay, let's just be honest. Let's call a spade a spade, right? You and I, um, we are not we are not going to be considering whether or not we're going to be fed tonight or, or for lunch. We are thinking about what we're going to eat for lunch rather than whether or not we're going to have lunch. And, and that's a big thing, right? That, that is a huge thing for, for, for many, many people. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's almost a little bit like unrealistic for us, you and I, to be talking about this because we are not, we are not, at the end of the day, um, destitute, right? But I, I'm concerned genuinely that, that people in, in KL and Malaysia, we get comfortable, we get lazy, we get unmotivated, and then we don't push as hard as our neighbours or our, or our more hardworking peers, right? Whether or not they're the Bangladeshis or the Nepalese, and then we lose ground. And that's very important because your dad hustled because he had a hustle. Today, you are reaping the benefits of his hustle. Right, and in Chinese, uh, in, in, in the Chinese uh, uh, what, um, mentality, there's this three generation curse. Right, the founder makes the money, his children get to enjoy it, and then his children's child, the, the, that person's child, then waste away all the money, and then the fourth generation gone. Right, so I in, in 20, 25 years of meeting successful people, right. The one thing that I notice above and beyond everything else as a predictor of success is not because of how well-spoken they were or not how educated they were. It's about how resilient they were. Because that, that bugger, he gets knocked down, he's going to come back up again. He's going to keep on coming back because that which does not kill him only makes him stronger. 
Do you, do you know what I mean, right. right? Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, I, I, would, I used to be very afraid of failure um, before I even, you know, did start up the startup or anything in life, really. I was, I was very reluctant to start something um, because I was always afraid to fail. Um, when I first heard my first no, um, you know, when I, for, for, when I was starting up this business, I was distraught. Like, I, like for two or three days, I could not stop thinking about wow, it. Wow, yeah. Um, and I mean, we're talking within my context here, right? So uh, that, that, was, that was a real bummer for me because obviously I thought that, okay, this is a time for me to prove myself. I can actually do something and I can actually validate uh, myself and, and, and what I want to do. Um, but, but obviously, uh, being told no is, is difficult. But now, after being told so many, no so many times, I've actually gotten to that point where I kind of welcome it. It's like it doesn't bother me as much anymore. And that resilience just now when somebody tells me no, I just tell them, okay, you know, I'm just going to prove you wrong. If you don't want to come join me, if you don't want to, you know, come on board, um, then, then I'll go find someone else who will. You know, so that resilience has, has definitely built me into a stronger um, person characteristically, personally, but from a business sense as well, um, you know, that resilience, all it does is drive you forward and, and, and yeah, that, that's, I think, inviting, I, I don't invite failure, but I kind of use that as a crutch to take myself to the next level, right? It, it's very valuable, um, that whole idea of being knocked back because it only makes you stronger. Right? And I, I love the fact that today, there's a lot of entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs in the tech ecosystem in Malaysia who are taking the plunge. And I, let, let's be honest, right? In many cases, they don't have, they're not facing the abyss of bankruptcy or, or destitution, right? But they are still in the trenches, people like you guys, still facing the uphill challenges of trying to make it happen, right? And every no you get, every obstacle you face, every uh, road bump you encounter, it only makes you stronger and gives you more armor on your back and that make, will make you a better person, right? I, I think that everybody should start a business. I, I do. I Honestly, I do. It is, more, it is more unstable for a young person now to join a company and to take the salary and the privileges and the benefits in inverted commas. It is more risky to do that because of the way the world is today and look at COVID last year, right? Than it is to start your business where you are in charge of your destiny, and then you can you can armor up yourself. You can become more resilient. You can become a stronger person because Nietzsche said, "Man, you know Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher, that which does not kill you only makes you stronger." It makes you stronger. Yes, yeah. yes. I mean, starting out your own business. Uh, I mean, I, you're right. The whole reason I'm able to do this is because I'm fortunate enough to be able to do this. I'm not facing bankruptcy. Um, I've put in my personal money into this uh, to, to start this, right? And that's the risk that I take, being in the position that I'm in. Um, I want to do good, and by doing good, I obviously, you know, the, these are the resources that I've been equipped with that my father had left me. And so what do I do with that? I want to do good, right? So taking care of my family, whether it be wealth creation is the first step to that. But also, what do I do with those resources in helping my family? What can I also do at the same time to help others to put food on the table for my family? And so the business model that we've come up with at Hey Alfred really in, allows me to fulfill both things, right? So to, to commit myself to my family and fulfilling my father's legacy. And then at the same time, um, I'm trying to contribute back with what has been given to me in life, which I'm fortunate and blessed enough to have been given, right? Um, so this is my way of contributing back. I'm starting up my business, you know, the hustle, that's all, you know, in the personal sense. And the, but then after that, what we're putting out there, we're hoping that this is really making a massive impact on people. And, and really also just helping people become more, more aware of the fact that, okay, sometimes... Sometimes you don't know you need help until you're told you need help, right? And especially when it comes to finances, people don't know that they need help. Um, personal finance, especially, like everybody, you know, they say, okay, I ask somebody, how much do you see? They say, oh, you know, I put 200 ringgit aside, but then I say, how much do you spend? But they never see that correlation, you know? So, you know, that, that awareness and, and, and helping people uh, understand, um, you know, the motions that they need to go through in order to make their life more successful, um, uh, you know, it's something I strive and, and I love doing. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, I, I've come across many, many privileged children in, in my lifetime, right? And there's a lot of them. There's a fair amount of them who don't, who don't take the plunge, who don't, who prefer to enjoy the privileges and reap the rewards of having a wealthy father family, and not, you know, and not put, you know, your shoulder to the grind and make it happen for yourself. I, I like that you, you guys are doing it. I acknowledge the fact that you guys are not. Um, from the B40s or you, you, it's not a rags to riches kind of thing. Not that you guys are at the richest level yet, right? But you're, the, you're not coming from rags. But I like the fact you guys are putting your shoulders to the grind and trying to make it happen. And the fact that you just started this, right? Um, and you've got, what, 10,000 plus people on your platform? So the fact that you're putting out this content on Instagram every day, that, that is education. Education is priceless. You cannot value education. Just one lesson is enough to put somebody on the right track, right? And if you just touch one person a day, that is a big thing. Okay, let's 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 wrap this up, mate. Let's let's have some key takeaways for whoever consumes this content, right? Um, what is the one thing you want people to remember from this conversation that we had? Um, I think okay. So the act of giving, the one of the things that we preach at Hey Alfred is trying to have an abundance mindset. So when you have an abundance mindset, what you're essentially telling yourself is there's enough of the pie to go around, right? So uh, giving is, is something that, I, that we feel, you know, as much as we're trying to help people save money here, Alfred, we're also trying to cultivate um, better relationships with money. And that doesn't, does, that doesn't stop at saving. That also, giving is also an important part of that, right? So having an abundant mindset, abundance mindset essentially means, you know, enough for everybody, enough to go around and my success is also your success, right? Um, so, you know, it's all well and good to, to be frugal with your money, but giving is also an important part of that self-satisfaction, self-gratification that, you know, like I said earlier, when, when you know that you've given, uh, you know, some money to charity, it hits differently. You just know that you've already directly impacted somebody else's life. Right, so I would say as much as, um, again, you want to be saving money, also give, give, give. It doesn't matter if you're super rich and it doesn't matter how much you give, um, as long as you give, right? I, I, you know, if you have 10 ringgit, give one. If you have 100 ringgit, give one. If you have a million ringgit, give one. It, I'm not talking about, you know, if you have more, you have to give more. Um, it's just making it a habit to make that a part of your life. I, I get the point of what you're saying and, um... I think what you're talking about is actually quite zen in that sense, in the sense that um, if you have an ab abundance mentality, you're happy with where you are. Right? And if you're happy with where you are, you don't have that craving, you don't have that envy. And envy is a, mm. it's a very um, counterproductive emotion to have. If you are happy with, with where you are, uh, you will never be um, unhappy, right? And that, that's a very important thing, right? And also, if you are happy with, with where you are and you decide to give back, if you make 50 cents, you give away 5 cents, 10 cents. Yeah. But that is very fulfilling. Mate, thank you so much yes. again. Uh, I want to. Thank you very much, Sean. Let's, let's rest on those thoughts and see you again next week, mate. You take care of yourself. Stay safe and take Appreciate care. Appreciate it. You too. All right, man. Oof. Thanks for having me back.